Well, just, yeah, just a little bit about us. Like Bungie said, we've been married three years, and our anniversary is January 26th. Good job. I got that wrong. I got that wrong on a Sunday. I, I thought it was the 18th for the longest time. And, <laughs> and um, after only three years, imagine that. It was the 26th. Uh, Jeremy and, and his wife as well, right? 26th, January 26th. So praise the Lord for that day. Um, uh, but the Lord brought us together. I gave my life to the Lord in 87, 1987. Uh, soon after that, I, I made a commitment to serve Jesus. And and I pray, I, you know, I, I told myself, and I remember reading this book called Why Wait, saying, well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to maintain my relationship with the Lord and be pure until God brings me a wife. And I made that commitment, and little did I know it was going to take 25 years. <laughs> Because if God would have said, well, it's going to take 25 years, I would have, well, maybe we can renegotiate. This <laughs> you know, that's a long time. But when it's one day at a time, it, it's, not, uh, it's not that long. So praise the Lord. The Lord brought Sheila into my life, and, and God's worked it all together. We're going to speak about uh, surviving serving, and let's open up the word of prayer. And we'll get right to it. Lord, again, we thank you for your grace and, and for the word you've already given us uh, through uh, Bungie and, and John and, and their wives as, as you spoke to our hearts, Lord, concerning uh, surviving stubbornness, surviving sickness, and, and all those other things, Lord, that happen in marriage that, uh, that the enemy wants to use to draw us apart, but you desire to use to... Help us to become uh, more like you, Lord Jesus. And I do pray for those marriages here uh, this afternoon, for ours, that, that you continue your work in them and, and that you would use all those things in marriage, Lord. Uh, the difficulties, the good times, the, the sick times, the better times, the worst times, to draw us closer to yourself, to rely on you, and even now speak through my wife and I, as we share about surviving, serving, and may you receive all the glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amos 3.3 3 says this, can two walk together unless they are agreed? And that's sort of the premise for this a message of surviving, serving while married. Uh, there needs to be, and, and what we have found in our, in our fellowship and in many marriages is that many marriages today do not operate as, as one person. The two have not become one. And because they haven't become one, then uh, if there's not commonality, then there will be conflict. And so there's great conflict in, in marriage. Uh, people get married, and, and maybe they get married later in life. And, and so they have, you know, there's a his bank account and there's a her bank account. <laughs> There's his money, and then there's her money, and just all these other things. They, they don't join together to become one, and it affects uh, everything that they do. It affects their relationship. Uh, but we need to hold all things in common. Acts 2.44, when the church began, says, And all who believed were together and had all, to, all, all things in common. And even when we pray, if we come into agreement and in Matthew 18, 19, it says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And so as we look at this commonality, this isn't an exhaustive study by any means, but we're going to cover a couple of different points. We're going to cover a, a common concern that we have concerning our, our relationship with Jesus, uh, our salvation, that we've both been saved, that God has come into our lives, and, and from that relationship with Christ, uh, is that relationship with Christ is our foundation for uh, not only for our relationship as well, but for our service unto the Lord. And, and then we have this common commitment to serve. In fact, a, a friend told me one time, we've been saved to serve, as Ephesians 2.10 says, that, 
that we have works that God has created for us, that we should walk in them and whatever that may be. And so the whole body of Christ needs to join together. So we have this common commitment to serve. And and one thing that uh, was so cool that Kendra shared, that even while sick and and in a difficult place, she still served the Lord. And and that just brought such hope to my heart that, all the excuses that we make for for not serving the Lord and his people in, in whichever means it may be uh, are just that, that even in difficulty, we can still serve God. And and then we have a, a common goal as well. We, we have one place or, or a certain place we want to reach in, in our relationship, uh, even as, as Paul said in Philippians 3.13, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. And and that common goal is simply uh, the reason why we do what we do and trying to go forward in our relationship with the Lord. And I'll speak more about that. So to to sum just the message in maybe one sentence, it would be in order to survive serving the Lord, in marriage, you need to hold all things in common, having a common concern, a common commitment, and a common goal. So let's look at this common concern. Uh, the first aspect in, in uh, which our marriage survives on is, is by having this common concern for our devotional life for Jesus Christ. As I mentioned before, it... Um, I have been single for, for many years, and, you know, people have prayed for me from all over the world, so to speak, <laughs> and, 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 and I remember even one pastor in, in uh, Nova Sabir, Pastor Bill Shepard, told me, Joe, you know, I stopped praying because I said, well, th- you're never going to get married, dude. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the boat has sailed past, and that's it, and... You know, the fish aren't biting. There's nothing going on. It, you know, it's, it's you're a bachelor until the rapture, and that just take it, <laughs> right? Just, just serve the Lord and get, get joy from serving him. And so he said, I stopped praying for you. And, uh, and, and for a time there, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm content to just serve Christ where I'm at. And, and then the Lord uh, brought Sheila into my life, and, and, and I looked at her life. Because being a senior pastor, I, you know, I knew I, I need somebody congruent to my relationship with Christ in, in this respect. She has to understand that if she's going to be the pastor's wife, um, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. And, and whatever that entails, she's going to become part of that. And, and so I, I don't want to say I inspected her life or or Googled her, you, or, me. you know, but but I kind of did. I mean, I kind of like, well, how does she serve the Lord? And and Dennis, uh, she served with Dennis there in Harlingen for many years. They they knew her well, and um, and so her background was was great. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Was great, oh, yeah. and um, and and you know, they encouraged me, and I just said, you know, I need to take this step of faith. Just go forward and and. Um, our first date or meeting together is, is when I kind of said, you know, we need to get married. And, and she said, no, really. We, we just, it, and, and it was like a, she said it was like a business meeting at Starbucks. We did it at Starbucks. And, hey, you make up your mind and you go forward, all right? <laughs> But our marriage survives, and we survive serving the Lord because our relationship with the Lord is very important to us. And and it needs to be that for for all of us because we can't possibly survive serving God without keeping our devotional life fresh and alive. And, And trying to serve God while empty is very difficult. I mean, it's difficult even serving him when, when you're full on his word, much less when you have nothing in the tank to offer those uh, that are constantly vying for your attention and for your help. You, we all need this 
devotional life with the Lord. And Colossians 1.10 says this, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we have this common concern to, uh, to have a devotional life with the Lord, to gain strength from him. And someone once said that devotions are like exercise for your soul. Just as we exercise our body, right, for those of us who do exercise. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, we'll, we'll just leave it there. I mean, just as we exercise our body, you know, to increase our strength, to get endurance, to jump higher, go faster, to, you know, whatever it may be, uh, devotions are like that for our soul. Devotions are like that for our soul. We, we spend time with the Lord. We pray. We gain strength. It, it encourages us, and, and when those difficult times come, well, then we have that foundation, and, and even we, we do a little different things sometimes. A couple of years ago, so what do we do for devotions? Well, uh, currently we're reading the one-year Bible, and, and usually we'll read it together. Sometimes we won't, but we'll still be on the same portion of Scripture together as we cover that, and uh, we'll pray, we'll, we'll ask the Lord to intercede on our behalf, but, but we gain strength from our daily devotion with Christ. And I understand that's very fundamental to our relationship with Jesus. When you become a Christian, you'll hear it again and again and again, right? And again, you'll hear it over and over and over. Spend time with the Lord. Read the Word. Pray. And I'm just telling you again, you need to do that. When I first got saved, someone told me, spend 15 minutes a day in the Bible and God will change your life. And I found that he does just that. And so I would encourage you to spend, spend time in God's word. Don't, don't waste uh, your life without the Lord. Every day, seek out some time to spend with him. My turn now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, <laughs> Actually, Joe found this really cool quote by John Piper. I haven't read his book, but it says that it's talking about cultivating delight in the Lord, and he's talking about devotion. So I want to just read this quote. It says, when a couple falls in love, there are hormonal fireworks. But when married, they must cultivate delight in one another. The consistent, persistent, faithful, intentional, affectionate pursuit of one another during better and worse, richer and poorer, sickness and health, that cultivates a captivity for delight in each other far deepens and richer than the fireworks phase. Similarly, devotions are, way, are one of the ways we cultivate delight in God. Many days it might seem mundane, but we will be surprised at the cumulative power they have to deepen our love and our awareness for him. That's a quote from John Piper. But as I was reading that, I was thinking um, that doing our devotions, sometimes together, sometimes not, but we at least are all, we're always reading the same thing, so the Lord's working the same words in our lives. It adds um, delight, and it deepens our relationship, obviously, with the Lord, but with each other. It um, increases things that we have to communicate about, and it connects us at that spiritual level. Um, so practically, um, it gives us something, you know, when it's dinner, right, or date night, and you don't want to talk about the kids or how was work, we have something in common. We read the same thing today. So what did the Lord speak to you today? What did he say? Or, you know, you, for him, he posted on Facebook every day, whatever verse that he really loves out of what we read in the devotion. So it's like, okay, that's at least common ground. Um, so it gives us um, that ground to start conversation with. Also, it helps me, and I assume him, to have insight into what the Lord's doing in our lives and helps me to know how to pray for him. So he's Mr. Comedian up here. But for those of you that know him personally, he's a man of few words, right? So he doesn't talk a lot. So this is the way I get him to talk to me. I can always get him to talk to me about the Lord. So um, it's, you know, it, the way that we have this common concern that our devotional lives grow, but it deepens our relationship and our marriage as well. Why say a hundred words when you can say it in two? You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it, it's an economy of language. It's yeah. what it is. No, I'm not verbose at times, but uh, <laughs> hey, that's all right. So, so we have our relationship then with one another, and our relationship with the Lord is very important. It's important to cultivate that. Uh, so we have a, this common concern that 
that, that we continue our relationship with God through daily devotion, through prayer. And then we have a common commitment that, that we're going to serve in, in whichever way the Lord leads and guides us. As I said before, that we've been saved to serve and that the church is the vehicle that God uses to bless the world. Whether it's the, the church that you go to or, or the body of Christ as a whole. Uh, and so we, we're church people, you could say. <laughs> we, we're given to the body of Christ. And when I mean church, I don't mean you know a particular church, but church people as a whole. We're given to the body of Christ. And so everything that we have, our time, our talent, our treasure is one, and we devote it unto the Lord. It, it's not to be separate. And, and, you know, I have people ask me, Sometimes at church, uh, they'll want to teach something. They'll, in fact, I had one guy come and told me they, they wanted to teach one of the uh, grace groups that we have. And, and I told him, you know, well, you need to start serving. You need to start doing something. Uh, and because availability plus consistency will result in opportunity. But if there's no consistency and, and no availability, it, I'm, I'm not just going to you know, put you there, so to speak. And as we cover this common commitment to serve the Lord, uh, I believe that you can have a vibrant marriage, you can have a great family, you can have all these things, and you can still serve God. That they're not mutually exclusive of one another, but it's going to take some work on your part. It's going to take some effort. It's not just going to happen. Okay, there, there needs to be intention in, in our lives. There, there needs to be reason as to why we do the things that we do. There, there, there can't be, you know, haphazardness, so to speak. There has to be, you have to do things intentional in order for it to be fulfilled. Um, and so you can have both. You can have a great marriage, you can have a great family, and you can still serve God at the same time. And so just keep that in mind. Uh, concerning serving the Lord, Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints uh, as you do. In Galatians 5.13, For we were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. In Ephesians 3.10, which I mentioned earlier, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And even Jesus Christ, our example, for even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to what? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The church uh, needs all hands on deck. Let me just say it that way. All hands need to be on deck. Everyone's been gifted in, in different ways and means as we've heard before. Everyone has, I believe, uh, there's no unemployment in the body of Christ. God has a job for you, whatever that may be. And, and I realize there are difficulties that come up. You get sick, right? Uh, your husband doesn't want you to serve, you know? Uh, you can't do this. You can't do that. But you can still do something, whether it's serving your family, serving the body of Christ from home, or whatever it may be. And so please, please understand that, that you're robbing yourself and you're robbing the body of Christ of great joy and reward when you do not serve God and his people. And, and that's the absolute, uh, and I believe that's very true. I don't say the absolute truth, but that may be sanctified speculation. But you know. <laughs> So as Joe's saying, we have this common concern, um, our relationship with the Lord, and we have this common commitment that we're going to serve because of the love we have for Jesus. And it all, a lot of it is he quoted also was Colossians 1.10. It goes back to that. If our, we have this common scripture that, that kind of guides what we want to do. We want to walk worthy in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, meaning that we have some good works, and serving is that, 
um, and increasing in the knowledge that adds to why we do our devotions. But all of that's real big. And when the rubber meets the road, you know, practically, how do we do it? Um, so I have this husband now who often says things like, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. And I, let me just confess, when I'm in my flesh, mm, that one gets on my last nerve, right? But it's true. God's given us each 24 hours in a day. So how we spend it, you know, how we use it to honor him, you know, it's up to us. And as they talked, Brenda and Bungie talked about that liability, I mean, or being liable, we're responsible for how we spend our time. So, um, and now that we're married, we're one. So, you know, Joe talks about having been single forever. I was widowed for 21 years before we got married. So same time, years and years of being single, doing my thing, my way, he did his thing, his way. And now we have to do it together. Um, so part of it is really understanding um, that in all areas of her life, we're one. So there are five areas that all of you guys share. Um, we all have to figure out how are we going to manage our personal relationship with the Lord? How are we going to manage our marriage, our family, our work, and our ministry? You know, we're all juggling all of those balls. So we, we continue to go back to Amos 3.3 3, um, for guidance. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? And obviously the answer is no. If, if he's going in his direction, doing his own single thing, and I'm doing things like I used to do when I was single, you know, it's not going to work. We're not going to end up in the same place, but we have this marriage thing. You know, we're together. We're one. So what, you know, we have agreed that all of these areas, all five of those areas are important, and they all demand our time and attention. And we don't necessarily try to rank them, or this one's more important than that one. Obviously the baseline, it comes from our relationship with the Lord. But we have to serve God in all of those areas. And so we have to remain flexible. You know, there's times when there's emergencies and, you know, it might have been date night, which is, you know, serving that marriage. But if someone dies, I found your pastor kind of has to do the funeral. People have a way of dying, having babies and getting married at the most inconvenient times. <laughs> so um, <laughs> that happens, you know, it interrupts some things we have planned. So we have to be flexible. There's a pastor I knew um, in Harlingen at one time. I think he's in Bastrop now, but he would always talk about blessed are the flexible, right? They'll bend, but they won't break. So um, it includes all of our time, our talent, and treasure. And so that's that mindset. If you've been married for 100 years or five years or even one year you're engaged, I want to encourage you to get that mindset that all that you had, all of your time, all of your talent, and all of your treasure, it's not yours anymore. It's one. You're combined. So we move as a unit. And it, it's taken a little work, and it's the progress. You know, it's work in progress. We've only married three years, but it helps to balance things. Um, so we hold in common that commitment to our personal relationship to Jesus, which we talked about really is that devotion time. But I really want to add um, the importance of that. There's a quote in the Bible study I'm working on now, and, and it says, you cannot be with people all the time and have a ministry. The impact of your ministry to people will be in direct proportion to the time you spend away from people and with God. So time with Jesus is the ultimate priority. So whether that's the, the way that I serve my husband, the way that I serve my ministry, the way I serve in work, it's all, it comes from how much time do I have with the Lord? Otherwise, I'm empty, and you've seen, well, some of you have seen me in the flesh. It's not pretty. Um, so we hold that common commitment to our marriage, practical ways we do that. We set time aside for a Friday date night. And I know not all of you can have the leisure of every week. We don't have kids at home, so we can do that. But it's important that you set some time aside. What we do doesn't matter. It changes every week what we do. Um, but we've intentionally carved out. There will be a time in a week that everything goes on hold. Cell phones go off. and I mean, that's miraculous for him. Um, and I, I just, I know you, you might be thinking, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. The kids, this, but you know what? Our church family honors it. Our, my daughter honors it. My grandbaby honors it because we honor it. We set it aside. And it's not that if there's not an emergency, we're unavailable, but it, it, it needs to be an emergency. And people don't contact us. You would think that, you know, his phone's ringing all the time because he's a pastor. But you know what? Friday nights, we pretty much get left alone. And it's because we've set it up. And the other is we take away. He doesn't take off much from work. So on our anniversary, we do. We go away for that weekend. And again, I, I'm hoping it's a, an example that we're modeling, but it's important that we're committed to this marriage. And so we take time away for our, our anniversary. We have this goal. We're going to be at a beach for every anniversary. So, 
So far, we've made it. Um, most of them have been Texas beaches, but you know, hey. <laughs> no, that's not, well, in, in, for no. my birthday, he took me to Russia, and we did get to see the Black Sea, so that kind of counted a little bit, you know. All right, but we have this common commitment to our marriage, um, our commitment to our family life. Same, we have, my daughter has grown, and I have a seven-and-a-half-year-old grandson, which I could talk about all day long. Um, he, we have to keep the balance there. It's real easy, especially if you're a mom, and, and maybe if you're the stay-at-home dad, I don't know, that your kids become your idols, and your whole life revolves around your kids. But you know what? It shouldn't. Your life should revolve around Jesus, and these kids need you, they need to see you ministering to each other, and they need to see you serving in the church. Um, my favorite quote's from Elizabeth George. She says, what's, it's, what's important is not what those at church think about you, but what those at home think about you. So you need to keep that in balance. And so for me, I don't know if Joe struggles with this as much, but for me, it, it can be really hard because when the grandbaby calls, that's it. I mean, the world, I can't let, get my whole world revolved around that little boy. So I have to really keep in check. You know, there's other things. He, he's important, but we have a lot of other things we have to balance. Um, so I would encourage you to take care of your kids at home, though. It can go on either side. We have families that, you know, I don't know who's raising their kids. But they might be serving, but no one's raising their kids. And then the other side is people don't serve um, because their kids have become their idol and their kids. It's everything. It's all about their kids, which I get. But I want you to be asking, if you earn that boat, ask yourself, what then are your kids going to do when they grow up? They're just not going to magically grow up and serve in church because they never served in church when they were kids. So you can have a great marriage. You can have a good family life. You can love on your kids. Bring your kids to church. I promise you every church needs someone to clean. Kids can clean. Put them on the cleaning crew. You know, you can find a way to serve at church, and your kids can be a part of that. Um, They need to know that they're important, that you're not always at church serving, but they also know they can be a part of it. And then there's this work thing. And everybody in this room has work to do, whether it's at home, whether it's, you know, away from home. So finding that balance of how you're going to serve the Lord in your work. I mean, the key here for us, the way that the marriage survives through all this and with work as well as the services church is just to respect and value the work that everyone does. Everybody is working. Um, And praise God that you have each other. I mean, I was single for a long time, and I was a single mom for a long time. It's no fun to do it all. So this is sort of my tongue-in-cheek. To those of you who have been married for a long time, don't be whining about the way your husband didn't do the dish or the wife didn't do this or that, because you know what? You're darn lucky to have them. And if you didn't have them, you'd be doing all the dishes yourself, and you'd be mowing all the lawn yourself, and you'd be paying all the bills yourself. So if they're helping encourage them because whining about how they're not doing enough is not going to encourage them to do anymore. So just think about that. That was from my single days when all the married couples would come and whine to me about their husbands not helping. And I'd be like, really? There's no one mowing my lawn either because guess what? I'm doing it. So if you're married, you're blessed. Amen. Be and blessed. just a little side, one thing I learned is the dishes don't wash themselves. No, they don't. <laughs> if you know what I mean. They don't. Dishes don't wash. They don't get up and jump in the dishwasher. They don't. The blessing is when you marry someone who's been single a long time, he really knows how to take care of himself too. So it's really awesome. (laughs) As opposed to if you get married young, right, you have to learn it together. But, I mean, rethink these things through. You know, maybe you guys have just gotten in ruts and rolls about who has to do what. But remember, before you're an engineer or a doctor, or a stay-home mom, or a pastor, whatever you are, you're a child of God, and you're to honor each other, and love each other, and respect. We all have work to do. God wants us to work. Um, it's good for us, and, but we need to keep in mind Matthew 16, 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So I would submit and suggest that there's little profit if I gain the whole world, because I am the best social worker there ever was, um, but I lose my marriage, my family, no ministry at church. I have no witness in the workplace. It's for nothing. Um, and then again, we hold in common our commitment to our ministry. We each have ministries at church, and sometimes like this, it's cool we get to serve together, but most of the time, we have different ministries, different times, different places. Um, and it's an area that can be really hard. I understand if you're in a marriage, and I guess specifically I want to speak to the spouse, whoever it is that has his heart to serve. 
um, and the other spouse is just not interested or not available, I just want to encourage you to continue to seek the Lord because that's where you need to be first, but to be careful and considerate of the other person's wishes because remember that your time, your talent, and your treasure belong to each other. So if you have a spouse that's saying you spend way too much time at church and not enough time at home, you know, is it because you think it's your time? You know, somehow there needs to be a discussion about that. Um, wives, um, you need to be submissive to your husbands in this area. If he doesn't want you at church, every time the doors are open, there needs to be a lot of prayer about what God's asking you to do. Um, and I would really, really encourage you guys not to be involving yourself in things if you don't have agreement because every minute that you're away, either one of you is away, it's taking time from that unit you're supposed to be doing together. So um, if you are in a place where you need to serve from home, and, and Kenda talked about that because of illness, but I promise you every single ministry in your church needs a prayer warrior. You just ask the, whoever's the head of that ministry, ask them, how can we pray for your ministry? People need cards and letters of encouragement like Kenda did. Man, those are gold when you get one of those. Um, some families need an extra meal. Maybe if you're cooking, you can cook an extra meal. Someone else can take it. And almost every ministry needs someone to do administrative stuff. You know, if you're crafty, you can cut things out. You can type. You can help do things. You can fold bulletins at home. There are things that can be done. Um, and then just on the flip side of that, because I've seen both in the zillions of years I've been alive, um, examine your heart. Um, are you committing to all these activities at church because you're trying to escape duties and relationships at home that need your time and attention? So I don't want to discourage anyone from serving, but I've seen people, I've seen people in my family, the marriage gets rocky and it's just easier to serve at church because everybody at church loves me and everybody at church thinks I'm great. And at home, there's a lot of contention. Take care of business at home. Take care of your marriages and seek to serve the Lord in harmony. Amen. Save to serve. Save to serve. Yes. Amen. So common concern for our devotional life to serve. And then we have a, a common goal. I mentioned that verse in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So the question is this. Um, why do we do the things that we do? Why, why do we do the things that we do? What purpose is there behind our actions? Uh, for us and, and for all of us, it should obviously be because we love the Lord, right? We, we're grateful for what he's done in our lives. Uh, we, we're thankful for everything he's done, so out of a grateful heart, we, we want to give back, so to speak. We know, understand, we can never repay God, but yet God has placed that desire in our heart to serve one another. But, but why do I serve? And I would, I would submit, I serve to, to walk worthy in, in a manner of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Uh, and so what we need, and, and what Sheila and I have done is we have this, this common goal that, that we've set for both of us, this common vision for our marriage, um, for, our, uh, for everything that we do. Helen Keller said this way, she goes, what would be worse than being born blind uh, to have sight without vision? And so, so what, why do you do the things that you do? What, what does God have for you? What, what are you reaching forward to? You see, and, and just like so many marriages, unfortunately, have not become one, everything is, is separate and in disarray, and, and there's conflict in that marriage, there, there's also not a goal that they've set for themselves. That, uh, and whatever that may be. Um, uh, you want to speak about that a little bit? Yeah. I, I just, the encouragement is to ask yourself, well, to set a goal, number one, and to ask yourself about your goals. Are they goals or are they dreams? You know, we all have a dream of having a perfect marriage. You know, the little white picket fence and however many kids and everybody's, everything's going great. But if you're not actively working toward it, then it's just a dream. It's not a goal. So if it's a goal, um, it has some common, it has objectives. There's defined steps. You, you've got to, you know, you should be able to measure those. And you should look back. Are, are we heading toward this goal? 
So each day you should be able to um, think about a decision you're going to make. Someone asks you to serve in this ministry or someone asks you to go here or do you have 50 bucks you can loan me or any of these things that are going to tap into the time, talent, and treasure that belongs to both of you. A question can be asked, is this going to take us toward or away from our goal? And it, you should really know what it is. And, and Joe's going to talk about the goal that we have, but it doesn't mean that's, it may not be a goal that's anywhere related to any of you. But I would encourage you, you should have a family goal. So, so you've been married 10 years, you didn't set one. It's not too late. You got all weekend. Get together. But, you know, where do you want to be? Literally, where do you want to be in two years and five years? Do you, you know, still want to be um, serving in this way? Where do you, where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? And then how can you reach that? I mean, I used to always say my life goal was I was going to speak Spanish fluently. And there were years that that was a real goal. I went to Mexico. I took Spanish lessons. I took class. I practiced. And now it's a dream. I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to just like, boom, Spanish on me. Because I haven't studied Spanish or used my Spanish in like 10 years. Okay, so that's a dream that I'm going to learn to speak Spanish because I'm doing nothing toward that. I want to be skinny too. I'm only doing a little bit toward that. So... <laughs> You know, that's still a dream at this point. It's not a real measurable goal yet. Um, but I want to encourage you that you're, you should set goals as a family, and they can be reviewed. They're not set in stone. It's not the Ten Commandments, you know. Um, pray over them. The goals need to be in submission to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so it's the Spirit that, I mean, he longs to for us to be united as one, and he's going to direct it together. So you can't work on that Amos 3, 3 thing about two walking together if you have different goals. You know, if this one's goal is to be the, I don't know, whatever, the head exec and make 100000 and this one's goal is, you know, something completely different, to have a farm and never live in the city. I mean, you can't. You're not going to work if you don't have goals together. So develop a common goal and then actively work toward it. So my recommendation, if you don't have a goal, is that maybe just sit down this week and just discuss your dreams, your individual dreams, and then dreams of what, you know, maybe you need to go back to what I thought it would be like when we got married, because maybe that, that's where we're living in some false expectations that you've never talked about. So that would be my recommendation. Set a goal to talk Set to each goal. other this week, if nothing else. Set a goal. And just again, to reiterate that, just understanding that God at any time can come in and say, well, you know, we're changing the goal, right? <laughs> we're, we're doing something else. And in whatever way he does that, whether it's it's sickness or or death or or whatever it may be, we we comprehend that uh, personally for us uh, in in our ministry there at the church, we we have five missionaries uh, that we support. Um, they didn't all come from our church, but we want to in ten years have ten, and then be able to go out and and visit each one of them uh, in those years that come. But in order to do that, you know, what is it going to take in order to do that? Well, in 10 years, are we going to physically be able to do that? And so, you know, part of our goal, we need to take care of ourselves physically. Otherwise, we won't be able to walk in 10 years <laughs> and uh, too much torchies tacos and, and we'll never get up the steps, right? No, and, and it, it's just part of the deal. So spiritually, will we be ready to minister? Will we be filled up on God's word? Because if we quit our devotions, then, you know, we'll become a tourist in 10 years, right? Instead of missions, uh, being mission-oriented. And, and then even financially, how are we going to do that? And, and so we're intentional about developing a plan and, and getting that together so that it happens. But then again, it may never happen. God may change, you know, change our plan, which is fine. Because God is good, right? And, and, and his way is better than, than our way. And you may say, well, you know, I don't know what kind of goal we need. Maybe you need a goal just to have a daily devotion. You and your wife. To spend time in the word. Maybe you need to set a goal. We're, we're going to serve God some way, somehow. We're going to serve his people. But we're going to love him. Maybe we, we need a... You know, take care of our family better or spend more time with the kids or, you know, whatever it may be. But you can be intentional uh, about those things. And, and just to wrap it up, uh, because I believe we got till 3 o'clock. Two minutes. Two minutes. Just to wrap it up. The key to all of this, the key to all this stuff is communication. 
communication. Uh, if you're not communicating with your spouse, you're going to have difficulty. And, and it's not going to work. You need to talk. And, and if you're here this weekend and you have trouble speaking with your spouse, you, you, need to, you need to spend some time together and say, hey, where are we going? What are we doing? You know, what's happening here? Are we just going through the motions? Do, do we have a, a path that we want to follow? Does God have a plan for us? And he does. He does. And, and he wants you to, to find out what that is. Because he wants to do you know, incredible things in our lives that, uh, that we can't imagine and we can't even think. He's able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And it may just take that. Maybe you just need to spend some time together, pray with one another, go before the Lord and ask him, Lord, help my marriage. Help us to become one. Help us to hold all things in common. And then out of that, the Lord will begin to, to do great things in your life and in your marriage. And so that's my prayer for you for this weekend, that you would walk together that you wouldn't walk apart, that the two would, would become one, that you would share all things in common, and that the Lord would do great and mighty things in you and through you, uh, and that God will continue to bless you and keep you. Uh, it's been a, just a great opportunity to, to share with you. We love you. Uh, we're praying for you, and, and we prayed uh, for this conference, and we'll continue to do so and just Thank you, Pastor Bungie and Brenda, for allowing us to come up here. We love you guys.